three, there we go. Now what? Um, you can turn me down just a little bit now. All right, practicing commending others. In verses one through four, we saw that he commended Gaius. And Gaius was a, a truly a disciple of the truth. And then he expands on it a little bit by uh, talking about the beloved. Now, we might ask the question, who is the beloved? It's all other Christians. Because he calls, Jesus calls us the beloved. And we're going to look at some verses on that tonight that helps us to see that concept. He's talking to all of us as Christians that we're to continue to practice the truth, practice principles that he gives us in regards to our lives and the lives of other Christians. And the case here that we're going to look at tonight in verses 5 through 8 is the matter of commending other people. Let me ask you a question before I pray. How many of you like to be thanked when you do something? Raise your hand. Does it make you feel good? It makes you feel appreciated, doesn't it? And that's what John was trying to do in, his, uh, in, the, in the verses 5 through 8 to individuals, though he did it in an amplified way to the life of Gaius because he was practicing the truth. And he knew that if he would commend him, then he began to uh, maybe commend some other Christians who he was dealing with. And so John wanted to push it a little bit further in calling uh, the attention to the beloved, those who maybe are sometimes overlooked in our congregations. You know, we don't think they do very much. They may not sing in the choir. Uh, they don't cut the grass. They don't smoke and they don't chew and they don't date those girls that do. And, and sometimes they don't get attention. And they don't get a hand clap. They don't get a, uh, you know, a word from the pulpit. They don't, uh, they don't get, uh, you know, uh, hey, we appreciate you doing this. So he said, let's just go beyond, uh, you know, giving a hand clap to the choir and to the preacher and the deacons and trustees. Let's look at that person who might be cleaning the bathrooms or might be doing some other things in the church that we don't often really, uh, you know, show our appreciation to. And so we're going to see about that tonight and what we're actually to do in, in these verses 5 through 8 in regards to practicing it. Everything takes practice in our life. And when we get into that mode of doing it, then we automatically do it. And of course, one of those things he says, we need to commend people for what they do. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into verses 5 through 8 tonight and ask the Holy Spirit to teach us. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We pray tonight that it will be a, a refreshing time to our lives, an encouraging time, and Lord, a challenging time that we might uh, adhere to these principles you're trying to get across to us uh, through this great servant of God, uh, the Apostle John. And Lord, we pray that we might carry out and practice these things that he's trying to get across to us as we close the end of the chapter. May your will be done, Father, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're not going to go into detail on this tonight, but I talked to you uh, a week before last about three people that he really zeroes in on this chapter, and he really wants to uh, amplify his commendation for the first two. And then he comes down at the end of the chapter to warn us about an individual by the name of Diotrephes. And I'm not going to get into the study on that tonight. We'll get into that next week, Lord willing. But uh, he wants us to understand we have a great responsibility to not only commend, now listen, but to condemn those are doing wrong. Those are not being what they ought to be. Uh, I believe if a, if a person's a Christian, then we ought to commend them. But I believe if somebody's a Christian and they're not doing what's right, we need to tell them about it in a kind way. Uh, we find that in the book of Galatians chapter 6, don't we? Where he says, if a, if a person be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, go and do what? To restore such a one in the spirit of what? Meekness. Meekness. That means kindness, humbleness, so forth. And so we need to do that. All right. So uh, let's, uh, did I pray yet? Man, I, I get talking. I, I don't think I prayed yet. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Touch us and teach us by the Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm having a senior moment. I did pray, but that, it doesn't hurt to pray again. Amen. 
All right, look at your outline tonight. Uh, we're going to cover, first of all, this matter of commending and practicing faithfulness. Not only commending faithfulness in the other people, but I think that you and I need to practice faithfulness in our own life. Why? Somebody give me a reason why we ought to practice faithfulness in our life. Doc. We get better at the things we practice. Right? Give me another reason why we should practice faithfulness. Others see our faithfulness. Why right, other people see our faithfulness? What else? Here's one of the biggest things, and I, I concur with you on, on those things. Go ahead, Valerie. That, that's true, and all those things are right and good. Here's the thing that motivates me. Because Jesus was faithful. Because God the Father is faithful. Uh, you think about that verse in 1 John 1, 9. Would you quote it with me? Everybody ready? If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God constantly in His, uh, His dealings with mankind is faithful. He's faithful. Hey, look, uh, sometimes we cry a lot when God spanks us. And there's nothing wrong with us crying. But God spanks us, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. But sometimes we whine in the wrong way, don't we? Uh, God's going to be faithful in spanking you. You know why? He loves you. And by the way, that is a good characteristic that you and I as parents ought to carry out too. If our children do wrong, don't spare the rod. Now, I'm not talking about beating. But, you know, in our society today, uh, you know, people have, uh, you know, uh, kind of got down on uh, individuals that uh, spank uh, their children. Uh, yeah, you see what it did uh, to a generation when Dr. Spock said, don't spank. Okay? We raised a bunch of kids that don't know what it is to be disciplined and to live right and do what's right and choose right because they were not dealt with in the right way. Maybe parents overdid it in regards to literally beating their kids. That isn't what the Bible talks about. The Bible says we ought to not punish our kids. We need to discipline our kids. Okay? And so, uh, John wanted to get across a principle called faithfulness here. So, look back at verse number 5, and let's begin with that. He calls, right off the bat, he says, um, uh, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the who? Brethren. Brethren. Uh, by the way, uh, you can put behind that parentheses the cisterns too, all right? Uh, what we do to the brethren, we're to do it faithfully. Uh, give me some things that we can do for other Christians. Talk with me tonight. And we ought to do it faithfully. What are some things we ought to do? Pray. Pray, all right? Uh, don't think about just praying for yourself, but pray for others. Give me something else. Encourage. Encourage the brethren. Does the Bible teach that? Yeah. Most certainly. Give me something else the Bible teaches that we ought to be faithfully doing uh, to one another. What's that? Help them. And what'd you say, Valerie? My ears are stopped up tonight. Love the brethren. Love the brethren all right. Uh, do you love them just when they do good? No. You love me when they do bad. I mean, you don't you don't uh, agree with what they do wrong, but we're to love them. We're to be kind to them, as we said in Galatians chapter six. You know, we're to go to them in the spirit of meekness. Give me something else we ought to do for the brethren. Serve the brethren. We don't hear that too often, do we? But the Bible teaches it. Paul taught it in several of his uh, epistles about, you know, serving the brethren. What's something else? Anybody else got something I haven't thought of? Help in a time of need. Help in a time of need. Uh, uh, somebody else said help, but you can help them in other ways. They may have a need, a special need that we zero in on. Whether it be a financial, emotional, spiritual, whatever it might be, we need to do that. And it should be done on a faithful a faithful type of principle. Not just when, you know, uh, they, um, uh, they might do good or they might, uh, you know, do, do this or do that. We're to, we're to be faithful. Now, look at it. He, he goes into a little bit more depth there. He says, not only to the brethren, but who else? Strangers. Stranger. Who's the stranger? Now, I'm not talking about if they do something strange. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. It's somebody you don't know. Now, could that stranger be an unsaved person? Yeah. 
we're to try to help the stranger so as to influence their life that they may come to know the Lord. And sometimes we don't help the stranger the way we should. Now, I'm using an illustration. I'm not really trying to get my, give myself a pat on the back here. I'm using it simply as an illustration. Mona and I were in Miller's the other night. And uh, we were picking up some stuff. I can't even remember what it was. Oh, I know what it was. It was creamer. All right. And uh, uh, we went and uh, we were getting ready to check out. And this lady had this little kid. And, uh, uh, and the, ki the kid wanted a bag of potato chips or something like that. And she wasn't getting the bag of potato chips, but she got him, a, a, got, I think it was a, a soda. Yeah, I got him a soda. And so I, I kind of felt, so I turned around. You know what I did? And I, like I say, once again, I'm not bragging. But I paid for that for the person. I had the opportunity then to ask her if they went to church anywhere. And then I invited and I asked what the little child's name was and I don't even remember it now. But anyway, uh, I was able to invite them and they said that uh, I, I wish I'd had a track on me. I had not had my jacket on. I would taken it off, taken my tie off, you know, and so I didn't have a track with me. That is something we ought to always carry around with us because we have the opportunity to talk to somebody like that. But person was a total stranger. I never, matter of fact, I had never seen him in all the 12 years I've lived here. I have never seen this person before. But I had an opportunity to take and to, uh, you know, give them an invitation and talk a little bit about the Lord while we were waiting to be checked out. And we have all, the, all that opportunity. God wants us to be faithful that when we went, meet a, a new person, give them an opportunity uh, to hear from us and invite them to church or whatever it might be. Uh, we have so many opportunities. Folks, I want to tell you something. There's still a lot of people here in New London need to be saved. There's still a lot of people here in New London have never been invited by our church personally to come, maybe come to church. I mean, we might, be, uh, might have knocked on some doors and we had not been able to find... By the way, it's getting harder all the time to find somebody home. I mean, I can knock on 10 doors sometimes and I don't find anybody home. But, need to leave a track. And let people know, you know, that we're concerned about them. And that we, that we, 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 have, we would like to invite them to church. All right, and of course, uh, you know, invite them to Christ so we get an opportunity to uh, talk to them. But we need to be faithful handing out tracts. Many of you do that all the time. I know Fred and, and, uh, and Velma, they pass tracts out all the time. Matter of fact, uh, they pass them out sometimes before I get there, all right? Uh, but they pass out tracts. We ought to be faithful passing out tracts. Faithful witnessing for the Lord on every opportunity that we have. Why? Because there's not only to the brethren we ought to be faithful, but we ought to be faithful to strangers. We never know when we might entertain an angel unawares. We never know when we might be touching somebody's life. Now listen to me very carefully. Touching somebody's life that's getting ready to commit suicide. I've heard Dr. Jack Howes tell on many occasions where he's knocked on a door. And, matter of fact, one occasion, Dr. Howes was knocking on doors. And uh, this guy was up in the attic, and he had a rope around his neck. And Dr. Howes continually knocked on the door. And finally the guy took the noose off his head and went down and, talk, and started talking to Dr. Howes. And, and Dr. Howes led him to the Lord. And he told Dr. Howes, he says, I was getting ready to commit suicide. We never know... If we're going to meet a stranger in what they were going to do to their life or what was going to happen to their life. And if we're faithful, God will bless. And so not only are we to commend those who are brothers and sisters in Christ that they'll be faithful. You and I need to be faithful in all that we do. Listen, you never know. Are you listening to me tonight? We never know who we might have the opportunity to be a witness to wherever we go. Whether it's in a store whether it's walking up, up the sidewalk or wherever it might be, we might meet somebody that needs our help. But here's another thing. Do you ever realize this? When you're faithful to God's house, and I, and I realize there's, uh, there's situations that you can't always be in church. We know that. Uh, you might be sick, you, or you, you may have to go somewhere in case of emergency, or you're, you're, you're leaving and going out of town, or whatever it might be. I understand that. But I believe this with all my heart. If you have the opportunity to go to church and you don't go to church, you miss out on the opportunity of being faithful to minister to somebody at church that day that just needs you to smile at them 
if not a word of encouragement. You just never know who you might touch by being faithful. And John wanted to really drive this point home in regards to our lives, this matter of faithfulness. And so he was not only commending Gaius back in verses 1 through 4, but he now talks to the beloved, and the beloved are you and me. We are the beloved. And we're to reach out to the brethren and be faithful to them, and also we're to be faithful to strangers that come along our way. And so we need to do that. Uh, turn back to 1 John chapter 3, would you, real quickly? Just one, a uh, uh, couple books back. Look at John chapter, uh, I mean, 1 John chapter 3. Look at verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read the first verse, and I want you to read the second verse with me. Behold, that word behold there, if you study it out, means a beckoning, all right? A beckoning for our attention. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now read verse number two with me. Beloved, now are we the what? Now, stop right there just for a second. God gives you and I a, a certain identification. We are his sons and daughters. And because we are his sons and daughters and his children, we are representatives of him. And because we are his children, then we ought to emulate the same characteristics that he does to you and me. We have a God that loves us, so what should we do, folks? Say it with me. We ought to love other people, right? All right, what's the extent of our love? Just the same extent that God gives in His love. He doesn't exclude anybody. He loves the world. He loves everybody, see? And that's important because we're sons of God. Now, let's read the rest of the verse. That's to motivate us. And it doth not, read it with me, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be, say it again, like him. Now, right now, we don't have the whole capacity that God does, uh, for example, to love the unlovely. Why? Because we haven't reached that particular aspect in our life until we get to heaven. We will have that ability, though we won't be here on earth, but we'll have that same characteristics uh, at that particular time, but we'll, we, won't ha we don't have it to the fullness right now. And it says, for we shall see him as he is. Now, because of that, he says in the verse, very next verse, I want you to read it with me, verse 3. Here we go. And every man that hath his hope in him does what? Now, stop right there. John's been talking about you and I being faithful. In our day and time, we have a problem as Christians. And that is living lives of purity. But it should always be. Can I hear an amen? I mean, why? Because we have the whole, we have the what inside of us? Holy Spirit. Holy Holiness, that's how you and I can be pure. We don't have to yield to the flesh. That's why, once again, Paul uh, said in Galatians 5.16, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, you and I are to live purified lives and be faithful in that particular thing, in and through our lives on a daily basis. We have to deal with our lives in regards to sin. Um... I know Pat wouldn't mind me telling you this. Pat and Sandy were in my Bible study this morning. And Pat said, Preacher, I have a problem. I says, what's your problem? He says, I'm always having to tell God I'm sorry for something I do. I said, you ought to be sorry for that. That's a good thing. I said, that's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin. Remember the statement I made when I first came here? Keep short sin accounts. Keep short sin accounts. I mean, when you realize you've done something wrong, just admit it to the Lord. I mean, take care of the problem right away. 
I mean, don't let it fester. Don't let it, you know, uh, get in your system that you, and that you turn away from the Lord and you, you continue in sin. And Paul says a lot about that in the book of, in the book of um, my mind is blank, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. We have to deal with the matter of sin. So we need to be faithful along that line. Uh, turn over to Romans chapter 12 real quickly. And look at verse 19. We're, we're still talking about the beloved. Because I want to drive this point home. You and I are the beloved. And because Jesus was called the beloved. Remember what, Jesus, remember what the God, God the Father said by his son there in the, in the uh, Gospels? He says, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. Jesus was called the beloved. But you know something else? John was also called the beloved. And then it's expanded on to all Christians. We're all called beloved. All right, look there at um, Romans chapter 12, and I need to get there real quickly. Look at verse number 19, if you would. Romans 12, verse 19. All right, he uses, and, he, and he ta he's talked to us. Paul is uh, dealing with those at Rome, but he's also dealing with you and me. He says, dearly, Beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vince is mine, I will pay, saith the Lord. Now, I, I know that uh, there's a su another subject there, but I wanted to drive home the, uh, the, the part about you and me being beloved. And God wants us to understand we are His representatives. Can I hear an amen? We're walking in lives that God wants us to represent Him and to be uh, the kind of Christians we ought to be. So, uh, Paul, of course, he goes and says, in the book of Philippians talks about the matter of being beloved. And of course, uh, in chapter 3, we just read, uh, he says, calls us beloved. Turn back to the book of 3 John, if you would, real quickly. Look at verse number 6. So, he says, you're beloved, We've expanded from Gaius in commending them. He says, I want to commend you as a beloved for being faithful, not only to the brethren. You see your brother in need. Uh, by the way, if you see your brother in need and shut up your bowels of compassion, what does he say? How dwells the love of God in you? So look at verse 6. He says, uh, the next thing, we must all constantly represent ourselves uh, in the area of charity. He says, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. There's one thing to say that you love the Lord. There's another thing to do what? To show it and practice it. Dr. Dolphus Price. How many of you ever heard of Dr. Dolphus Price? I know my wife. Dr. Dolphus Price was actually like a daddy to me. And uh, he always called me Danny Boy. Now that was quite unique because he had never met my daddy. My daddy always called me Danny Boy. But Dr. Dolphus Price was like a, a daddy to me. And... Uh, he always had a statement that stuck with me ever since I first heard it. Now, Dr. Dolphus Price was in Vance, and he's in heaven now. I, went to, I was in classes with some of his boys and uh, uh, got to know them real well. And then I got to know Dr. Dolphus Price personally and been in his home and so forth and so on. But um, he had this statement that really drove home to me about loving the Bible. He says, and he'd hold his Bible up like this. And he'd say, Oh, blessed book of ages, how I love thy pages. I want to ask you a question tonight. Do you love the Bible? Now, we know the Bible doesn't save us, but the news that's in it saves us. This Bible is not to be worshipped. We're to worship God. Okay? It's like this. Let me illustrate what I'm saying here. Thank God for the Bible. All right? But remember the people of Israel when they were given the Ark of the Covenant? And they were always supposed to take the Ark of the Covenant when? With them. Where were they supposed to take the Ark of the Covenant with them? In the battle, right? Why? What was the Ark of the Covenant uh, representative of? 
the presence of the Lord. Okay? The presence of the Lord. They were to, you know, give great uh, reverence for the fact that we know that eventually, it, when it was in the tabernacle and then it was in the temple, uh, we know it was put into the Holy of Holies. But when the people of Israel went out to battle, they took the Ark of the Covenant with them. One day, they put their trust more into the Ark of the Covenant than they did God. Remember that instance? And they were, uh, they were fighting with the Philistines, and the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant from them. They were putting their trust in the Ark of the Covenant rather than God. We're not to worship this Bible. We're to worship the God of the Bible. Okay? And I'm afraid that some people touch right on the edge of worshiping the Bible more than they do the God of the Bible. We've got to be careful about that. We've got to be distinct. It's just like, I'm glad for the church. Amen? Now I'm talking about uh, just not God's people, because God's people are the church. Okay? But when we talk about a building, I, I think we ought to have respect for God's house. Amen? All right? But I'm not to worship God's house. I come into God's house to worship God. Okay? So there's a fine line there. And so the people of Israel, they began to take and to love. And that's what happened to the Pharisees, by the way. They loved the law more than they loved God. They were to keep the law because it was their schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. Just like it is you and me today. Uh, this Bible brings us to Christ, helps us to live for Christ, but we don't worship the Bible. We're to love the words of God, but we don't love it more than we love God himself. See, and there's a fine line there. But because we love God, we also love the brethren. We love other Christians. Uh, remember that little song that you're not, that, uh, how's it going now? I, I told the men this morning. Uh, they will know you by your love. Christians are known by their love. And that love is to not just be a verbal expression. That love is to be an outward show or a manifestation by what we do. That's what the, char the word charity means. It means love in action. Would you say that with me? Love in action. That's what charity means. He just didn't say love the brethren. He says have charity. In other words, do what you say you would do for the brethren. If you see your brother in need and you shut up your bowels of compassion, how dwells the love of God in you? See? You just have a false expression and not a uh, action type of love. And some of those whom uh, uh, Gaius went to and some of the uh, beloved went to, they were they were they were not loving the way they should. And the Bible talks a lot about uh, loving the brethren, loving one another, and matter of fact, uh, loving your neighbor. How? As yourself. All right. And uh, by the way, it also says in Ephesians 4, a husband loves your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay? When we think about that, what's the first word that comes into your mind when you love someone as yourself? Sacrifice. We sacrifice. Love sacrifices. Might be time, might be things that we do or things that we give, whatever it might be. So he says, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. In other words, it wasn't something they just held in or expressed verbally. It was something they did. Let me ask you a question. How much do you love the church? Now, I'm talking about primarily People, because people are the church. You take people out, you don't have any church. All right? But let's go a little bit further. God did give buildings to give due respect. And we go back, once again, mentioning the tabernacle, then the temple, then he gave the church. Okay? Do you love God's house? Think about it. Do you really love it? We should. He's given us a place to worship. 
thing. By, by the way, aren't you grateful for First Baptist Church buildings that he's given to us here? I mean, I really respect the fact and some of you folks that have put your blood and your sweat into this place. I know some of you have really done a lot up through the years. And uh, what you've done. And you've showed that charity because of the extent of time that you've maybe uh, helped doing something. I remember years ago when we were building an open Bible Baptist church, I helped lay some of the block for that place. And for the gymnasium and you know, the class uh, the, uh, buildings we have had there and so forth. You, it makes you appreciate uh, the place more when you do something. And uh, let me go a little bit further. When you see a piece of paper on the floor, what are you supposed to do? Pick it up. It's all our responsibility, right? If you see a little rock, and we have them around here all the time, man. We got, we got these little rocks, a little gravel. Pick it up. Take it out. You want God's house to look good. And, and let, let me give a, a commending uh, principle here. Deb, I want to thank you. I, I like the, the sayings. In, these, in this here, right? Amen? Uh, it makes your building look good. And, and, and you helped us do that. And other things you, some of you have helped in this, in this place to do. Because you love God's house. And you give due respect to the fact of what it represents. All right? And I think that we ought to take care of God's buildings and so forth. Amen? We ought to do it. This, this belongs to Him. He's given us an opportunity to be able to come and worship here. So we need to do that. But wait a minute. If you go ahead and look at verse number 7. The third point in your outline, we must do what we do for the name of Christ's sake. We don't do it to be in a limelight, to get a pat on the back, though. If we get that, that's good because we ought to come in to other people. Amen? And that's what the whole practice here that he's trying to teach in verses 5 through 8, that we practice you know, commending other people, uh, patting them on the back for what they do and, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the long hours that they might put in or what they do uh, around the church, uh, that, that means a lot. And John asked Gaius to help these Christians to learn this principle that we do it all to the glory of God. Would you say that with me? That we do it all to the glory of God. There's two area, two sections of Scripture that we have that Paul talked about in regards to bringing glory to God in the book of 1 Corinthians and in the book of Colossians. He, he matter of fact, he says, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all to the glory of God. Whatsoever you eat, we'll do it to the glory of God. And he, he comes in the principle of, uh, of uh, bringing out what we do for Christ's sake. And whether we do, uh, uh, you know, things like we do at Christmas time or at uh, Thanksgiving time or other times, uh, many of you uh, don't see some of our people and what they do for other people in need. Let me mention one. I want to thank all those ladies, Irene, Williams and Sandy back there every Tuesday and Thursday. They're right here hours. Now, they weren't too much here the other day, but they were here. And they're ministering. We say, oh, we, do we see results of that? I don't, but God does. And we're giving bread out to people that are in need and, and, and reaching people. And we give gospel tracts along with it. Sandy and him came up with the, the fact of putting some gospel tracts in a little plastic bag and passing them out. And that, those ladies, they work hard hours. If you don't think it's hard work, come over here and help them. All right? Uh, it takes hours many times to, you know, take care of all that. They begin out by putting all the bread and, and making sure everything's clean and everything's in order to give it out to people. That, they're doing it for who? For Jesus' sake. Didn't Jesus say, if you give a cup of water in my name, you'll not lose your reward? Well, we're not giving too much water out around here except the water of life, but we're giving bread. Amen? And uh, that's good. And there's others here. I, I, I commend you for what you do for the glory of the Lord uh, that many of you never see. Can I give another one? And please forgive me if I'm patting too many people on the back, but I think it's due. There's Bonnie there. How many of you like the flowers out front here? Huh? How many of you like the flowers and the, the, the thing up there where uh, Mrs. Crawford uh, Memorial? You like that? 
How about the, uh, the, over there for, it's, what's the name of the young man? Yeah, Jason Eller. Okay. Uh, she takes care of all that. And Bonnie, I hope you don't mind me saying, I'm just patting on some backs now. I'm commending you. And I know some other people here, they, they may not want me to say it, but like Doc. Doc, I knew you were out here trimming the bushes yesterday. And I saw that. I appreciate that. And there's other people here that do different things. Terry uh, makes sure the vans are filled up with gas and different things like that. And, and others around here, I might miss you, and I, I, I'm hesitant sometimes of saying something publicly because, public because I don't want to miss somebody. But I want to tell you something. This ministry can never run the way it is without people. Amen? And we need to thank people. We need to appreciate them. Uh, I might as well give, give you a pat on the back too, uh, Deb and uh, Jean, for the work that they do. Uh, many, many of you don't know the things that many, uh, like for example, the funeral uh, dinners and, and uh, many of the things uh, of, that go on around here that need organize, organized, especially the food area. Deb does that, all right? Uh, Jean and uh, Chris and some of the others with, uh, that work with them uh, for, with the uh, teens and the Olympian program. Uh, we could never have it if it weren't for people like that. Aren't you glad for people that are willing to do it for Jesus' sake? Huh? They don't get paid anything for that. But they do it because they want to see people and their lives change for the glory of God. Look at one line. Look at down there, verse number 7. Let's read it together. It says, because that for his name's sake they went what? Forth. That means they did something about it. They didn't just talk about it. They went and did it, see. They put that love in action. They put that commending in action. They practiced what they preached. And then it goes on to say, taking nothing of the Gentiles. In other words, they weren't getting paid anything. They did it. Our Sunday school teachers, our the choir, Doc leading the singing, all those things. Uh, that's commending people for what they did. And they do it for nothing. See? But look at the last verse. It talks about we all must be fellow helpers to the truth. If we know something's right and truthful, we ought to do it. Can I hear an amen? Okay? Look at the last verse. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. And we have to practice that. And sometimes, you know, somebody's struggling and they just need somebody else to pick up the other end of the table and help them. I mean, it gets tough sometimes. But when we see somebody that we can help, we ought to be a fellow helper. We're, folks, we're in this together. We're, we're trying to reach a community for Christ. And there's people out there that just needed, need some help knowing about Christ, growing in the Lord. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever thought about doing this? And I've got to stop here in just a couple of minutes. Have you ever thought about this for your own personal life? Taking and discipling somebody. Taking the time. It takes a long time to do that. But if you see somebody get saved or if you know somebody's a young Christian, why don't you go approach them and say, look, I'd just like to help you to grow in the Lord. Could we meet maybe a half an hour once a week and do some Bible study together? That's the reason I started uh, the Wednesday morning Bible study time. Because, number one, Brother Sandy, Sandy he wanted to be here on, on Wednesday night, but he couldn't come. I said, Sandy, how about coming? And then, of course, Norma uh, McConnell, many times, she'll come to my Bible study on Wednesday morning because she's working. Now, I, I don't know her schedule now, but uh, she's come. And she wanted to come so she could not miss hearing what we teach here on Wednesday night. Because I, I basically do, but of course, we make it a little bit more personal in the office there. And they can ask questions. And if you want to ask questions, you can ask questions too. But anyway, we're fellow helpers with one another. And folks, the, the load can get awful heavy sometimes when we don't look to see if we can help somebody. And we're to be a fellow helper. And it gets strainful sometimes, and the hours get long, and, and, and people get tired. And let me say this very quickly to you. Sometimes people burn out. Because they don't have any help. Right now, we need a teacher. 
here in just a couple of weeks for one of our classes. And so we, we want to ask you to pray about that. Uh, let's see, what class we call, uh, Irene, what, uh, what class does Mrs. Whitney teach? Third and fourth. I need a teacher for the third and fourth grade. If there's a couple of you that be willing to take it, a husband and wife situation or two different ladies. So if one needs to be gone, then the other can do it. We get tired sometimes, and we just need some help. So pray about that. Think about that. And let God speak to you. It takes time to practice, doesn't it? It isn't easy. I mean, sometimes you're practicing, you say, man, am I ever going to get learn this or, uh, you know, or get this done? But it just takes practice, and you just keep on practicing. And pretty soon it becomes a habit, and it, it's a good habit, you know. But it all comes down to this. We do it for Jesus' sake. Amen? And He is the one that's going to reward you. He's the one that's going to give you the power back. And by the way, do you ever realize this? We get our blessings here now. We get our rewards over there. Okay? So you get a double pay. You get your blessings now, plus you get your reward in heaven. Practicing, commending one another, and being faithful ourselves. Let's have a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. We pray that all of us will constantly practice the principles that we've talked about here, being faithful and, and, and loving and, and, and helping others and being fellow helpers uh, and doing it for your namesake, that you'll be glorified in the end, end result and people will be saved and Christians will be encouraged and people will be uplifted and, Lord, they won't burn out and they'll be drawn closer to you to keep on keeping on. May your will be done. We thank you for your word now in Jesus' name. Amen.